Okay, as you can see, I got uh, some new digs behind me. Sorry about the delay on any new content. I've been fairly busy, uh, not only with uh, moving and a remodel, but uh, I'm doing some pro bono work for a case, which is turning into another television show, and uh, it's taking up a lot of my time. But I didn't forget about you. So today I want to talk about the case of Jeremy Bright. Jeremy Bright was a 14-year-old kid uh, in middle school who disappeared August 14, 1986. I saw this on an episode of Unsolved Mysteries, so I wanted to dive into it. Unsolved Mysteries kind of gives me like a inspiration for some reason. Like when I see cases on Unsolved Mysteries, more than any other show. Maybe it's because of watching it when I was a kid and being, you know, shaping me to be a detective for the future. But regardless, this case is another one that has stuck with me and I wanted to look at it. There's some contradictory evidence or timeline disputes and stuff in this case. And that's why it's always so important to get actual police reports. Even though I went back in this case, like I do all cases and research newspapers, and I find that that information is more correct than just anything that you find on the internet, meaning forms. I don't use them at all. I don't even look at them. But even in this case with the newspapers, it was some, there was discrepancies, mostly among the timelines. But this is what I've figured out so far. So Jeremy Bright was 14 years old. He had lived in a place called Grants Pass, which is an hour and 58 minutes or 59 miles, depending on what you uh, want to go by, from where he disappeared, which is Myrtle Point, Oregon. Now Myrtle Point, Oregon is about 30 minutes away from a place called Coos Bay. Now I'm familiar with Coos Bay, Oregon because one of my idols grew up in Coos Bay. Who is that you ask? Steve Prefontaine. Steve Prefontaine was a mega track star in the late 60s uh, to mid 70s before he died in what was called a drunk driving accident I believe in 1975, but uh, as if you go back into my other videos, you'll see I did a video about it where I don't think it was a clear cut case of drunk driving. But anyhow, so I'm familiar with Coos Bay and Steve Prefontaine. I mean, they made two movies about this guy, Without Limits and uh, Prefontaine. Without Limits was definitely the better of the two movies. A documentary called Fire on a Track. And I was not I was never even a track guy. I ran only because I had to run. And I was in the Marine Corps and I was in uh, Police um, Academy. Other than that, I didn't like to run. But when I watched this guy, he inspired me to run. And he was just such a rebel. You know, and Nike always said that they made a statue of only... One person that wore their product, and that was Steve Prefontaine. 
So anyhow, imagine my surprise and my joy when I get an email from Steve Prefontaine's sister. Um, just, I don't, it, I, it leaves me speechless sometimes. You know, when your heroes, when they can't reach out to you, but their family or friends do. Um, anyhow, enough about Steve Prefontaine. If you want to know more about him, go watch my other video. This is about Jeremy Bright. <clears throat> Let's get to the content. Jeremy Bright goes missing from Myrtle Point, Oregon, August 14th, 1986. He is there because he, he grew up there, okay? He grew up in Myrtle Point, but then his mom and dad divorced or there was some sort of um, arrangement where he went to Grants Point and lived with his mother. But on this particular day, which is normal for every year at Myrtle Point is they had a weeks long fair. In my neck of the woods, we had the same thing called the Grange Fair. So mom says, you know what? You can go back and stay with stepdad and attend the fair with your 10 year old sister. He does that. He brings along his friend, Johnny. We're gonna get into Johnny. In some places, he's described with the last name as Fish. Others, it's Gray. Again, discrepancies. Police report would tell you this. But it doesn't matter. His first name's Johnny, obviously. So, he's staying with his stepdad, who is a logger. He's 14. We have to look at victimology because victimology will tell you what he would do and what he wouldn't do now that is not always the case there's sometimes where you'll go against that but it gives you a good sense of where your investigation should take you this is a prime example of that so jeremy bright was an athletic individual at age 14. he was big from what I see, at age 14, he was six foot tall and weighed 140 pounds. Now, what does that tell you? Well, a lot of people, that tells you nothing. But it tells me something. So no, not only is he athletic, he is back home. He's not in a foreign place. He's in a place he grew up, so he knows a lot of people. Now, the fair will bring in people from surrounding areas. You have to take that into consideration as well. But just because somebody's athletic and knows a lot of people in the area, that's not enough for me. And it shouldn't be enough for any other investigator. You have to know more about victimology. This case is littered with possible scenarios, which includes the partaking of drugs, the possibilities of that. Now, those are things that you have to dive into. If an informant or a tipster tells you this, you have to be able to verify it or debunk it. And how do you do that? Not by talking to his mom or his family. Yes, you have to do that. But talk to his friends. That's where you're gonna find out things. And it ain't a simple question as is, did Jeremy do drugs? Because their answer could be no. But follow that up with a question like, did he succumb to peer pressure? Okay. Those things are, are important in determining what scenarios could have happened. Remember, in all cases, especially, you know, unsolved cases where you just don't know. You always want to know. That's the outcome that you want. And how do you do that? Possibilities. Okay, they're up here. And we want to start deducing things to get to a probability. That's how you solve cases. So, not enough about victimology, but what I do know, he's big for his size, athletic. I think he won some awards in basketball. He really enjoyed basketball. But I need to know more about his party habits. He's age 14. And the reason I'm bringing up drugs and party habits is because 
that plays into some scenarios that investigators got from informants and tipsters. So, the timeline. Again, this varies depending upon what source you go to. It's why you need police reports. But, in this case, I don't have them. So, we're going to go with Wednesday, August 13th, 1986. He attends the fair with his friend, Johnny. I don't know enough about what happened during that. Did they meet somebody new? I don't, I don't know enough. Things start getting interesting the next day, which is Thursday, August 14th. For some reason, he's at the fair, but he's not with Johnny. He's with his sister. Okay, this is the first red flag to me. Not that something uh, nefarious took place, but it's different. You have a 14-year-old kid. It goes back to victimology. I want to know about his relationship with his sister. A 14-year-old boy is not going to want to hang out with his 10-year-old sister at the fair. Okay? Now, well, maybe his victimology would tell you something different. That's what you need to know. But I guarantee you want to hang out with his friends, especially if he brought Johnny with him. So where was Johnny? At some point around 2 o'clock in the afternoon on Thursday, he gets split from his 10-year-old sister. Now, whether that was intentional, hey, I'm going here, you're going there. It has to be that way, and it can't just be we're splitting accidentally. We got lost in the crowd and split because according to Johnny's sister, or Jeremy's sister, I'm sorry, they were supposed to meet back at the Ferris wheel at 5 o'clock, and he didn't show. That's a red flag. Again, you have to go back to victimology. Is he responsible if he says he's going to be somewhere, will he be there? Why didn't he show? Initially, I'm thinking, okay, between 2 and 5, right now, is when something happened to Jeremy Bright. Yet, if we continue on, he is next seen at 9.40 that night at a bar at which his grandmother owned, and he met his stepdad there and asked for money. They seen nothing out of ordinary. Um, do I find anything out of the ordinary of that? Maybe. A little bit knowing that he's gone missing. What did he need the money for? 9.40 at night. That's not real late for a 14 year old. I don't know if he had a set curfew of when he was supposed to be in. But he's by himself. That is what bothers me a little bit about this. Um, if he was with a friend and they both came in, I would, you know, I don't know. Just one of those things that makes me, mm, he's by himself and he's asking for money. Why? What time's the fair close? Um, and how much money did he ask for? That's the last time that his family saw him. That's the last time really anybody saw him that's been confirmed. Now, after that point, there's various sightings of him by numerous people, but none of them really credible. Initially, mom, so mom, I left out a part and I'll go back. At some point on Thursday, before he split with his sister, Again, this is very confusing because there's contradictory. So I'm not going to pinpoint a date or time. During that fair time, so on August 13th, which is a Wednesday, he's at the fair with his buddy Johnny. The 14th is when he disappears and he's with his sister. On that day, he calls his mom back home and says, everything's okay. We're at the fair. She says, I'm coming to get you. Um, on, I believe it was Saturday, 8.15, it could have been Friday, regardless, again, it's all, it's all messed up, the timeline, you need the police reports to know for sure, but within those three or four days, mom shows up, 
to get Johnny at Stepdad's, he's nowhere to be found. Again, the last known credible sighting is by grandmother and stepdad at the tavern when he asked for money around 9.40 on Thursday night. And again, this is after he did not meet his sister at 5 p.m. at the Ferris wheel like he's supposed to. I need to know whether that is, that is that something that is out of character for him. That's very important to know. Not that something happened, but an event may have took place. An event being uh, not his murder, not his deciding to run away, some sort of thought process. He met with somebody and it precluded him from going to meet his sister. Not being forced, you know, to be stay, could be, he's being forced to stay away to not meet his sister, but that's highly unlikely because only four hours later, he's at the tavern getting money from his stepdad. For some reason he didn't meet his sister. I need to know why, okay? That's an important part of this. Initially, police, well, mom gets there uh, the next day or two days after to pick uh, Jeremy and his sister up and take them back home, and he's nowhere to be found. But what she does find, I think, Remember when a uh, few weeks or, I don't know, hell, a couple months now where I used to do Ken's key clue? My key clue in this is what she finds. She goes into the house of her, the stepdad and on the stand, she finds Jeremy's wallet. She finds his keys to the apartment that they own back in Grants Point and a new watch that he had bought. Okay, why is that a key clue? Well, it tells me he made it home, right? At some point in time, he was, he was home and then left again. That's what that tells me. So, people start coming forward and they said, in including the sister and says, I saw him forcibly being removed from the fair. Well, I need to know more about this, okay? If the sister, who's 10 years old, you know, really saw this, I think that would have been a bigger to-do. But it seems like it didn't, it's just like a passing statement. Like no one took that very seriously. Now, remember when I said about his height and athletics build and 140 pounds, six foot, and it told me something? It told me he wouldn't be forcibly abducted during the day from a fair. Now, I know what you're saying. You're already yelling at the screen saying, oh, anybody can be forcibly taken away. All you need is a gun or a knife. Very true, and I would be the first to admit that. But there would have to be a reason. Okay? Meaning, if, the, if it was an abduction and the attempt was, you know, sex trafficking, I think you would choose somebody a little different than a 6 foot, 140 pound athletic 14 year old. Okay? So I don't believe that that happened. Or you're being forcibly removed because of the intent. The victim, let's say, is, is being killed because of greed, because of jealousy, revenge. You don't do it during the middle of a fair during the day where there's hundreds if not thousands of witnesses. You just don't do that. Is it possible? Yes. Probable? No. So although I wouldn't discount this entirely, I'm certainly putting it down lower on the rung. Just like you do with when there's a death. You know, it's either natural, it's either homicide, accident, suicide. And you rank them accordingly. 
So him being forcibly removed from this fair during the day, yeah, I'm putting it, I'm putting it at the bottom. So a number of theories are brought forth right away. Police initially said that this was foul play. Okay, after the mom reported it, but then sightings started coming in by other teenagers in the area who said, oh, we seen them Friday and Saturday. Remember, he's supposed to have disappeared on Thursday. This is important. So police changed their mind. Okay, now they think he's a runaway. Again, victimology is going to tell you whether he's a runaway or not. Whether he succumbs to peer pressure. Think back to Ken's key clue and the wallet and the keys and the watch. He's not a runaway. Okay? I'm not going to say 100% sure, but it's down on the rung. Just, just like the being forcibly removed is. So one of the theories put forth is that he went to a party that night and was giving a alcoholic drink laced with drugs and he overdosed. I would think that if that was the case, and I've had cases like this, okay? Uh, I worked a case where a person overdosed and hell they buried him like I forget 150 300 miles away in the middle of the woods um, so it happens yet I don't that was easy to figure out because I knew the guy's victimology he was a heroin user so I mean yeah it, it made sense this one it doesn't make sense um, but again it, they say it was accidental how do you figure that out? Talk to other people that were at that party and confirm that he was there. Another more interesting, and although it seemed improbable at the time to me, the more I thought about it, I thought maybe this had some merit. It, someone came forward and said there were, Jeremy was swimming in a swimming hole with some other friends when a couple, three, four maybe bullies came to the area and was giving them a hard time. And they had a gun on them and they are shooting into the water, or target shooting and accidentally shoot Jeremy. They subsequently take him and take him to an old cabin and they try to nurse him back to health and he dies and they bury him. Now, boy, that seems far-fetched, right? Certainly does to me. But let me tell you why I gave it merit. Think back to Ken's key clue. Are you getting it? Some of you got it, some of you didn't. If you go swimming, you're not going to take your wallet, your keys, your watch. All those things come off, right? And then you go swimming. That has merit to me, okay? That would explain why his stuff is there. Yet. What bothers me about that, if that happened, you're telling me the other kids that he was swimming with are not going to come forward and tell the police that that happened? They're that scared? Yeah, maybe initially, but we're talking 30 years now. You're telling me they wouldn't come forward and say that that's what happened? So that's why that moves down on the rung to me. But there could be some truth in that. Some truth that he was swimming. Okay? But then something else happened. I don't know. But the swimming part has merit to me because of the wallet being left behind and the keys and the watch. That's To me, that's a perfect reason that those things are not with Jeremy. 
Now, Johnny, remember Johnny Gray or Johnny Fish, whatever his last name is, his sister had come forward as well and said she saw a man leaving the or coming into the apartment building and she was leaving it that night when Johnny Jeremy disappeared who was covered in blood this person's name was David she asked David well, what happened to you he's like oh nothing this was from before David turns out to be a cousin of a person named Terry who used to babysit Jeremy and his sister. In an odd twist to this, David and Terry were later convicted of murdering Terry's 32-year-old girlfriend, cutting her throat and throwing her over an embankment. There is at least one report that places Jeremy with Terry in Terry's vehicle the night he disappeared. Johnny's sister, who saw David covered in blood coming into this apartment building, told police this. Police did their due diligence, thank God, followed up on it, and stated it was from a fight that he had gotten into with his girlfriend. The sister says there was too much blood on him for just a fight with his girlfriend. I would think that if police knew this, they would have followed up very quickly. So I'm not sure what to think about this. But it shows that Terry and David both have the ability to kill, right? They, they did it. I wanted to know more about why. Are they killing for sport? Are they killing just, you know, because they felt slighted? Robbery, revenge. Why did they kill this girl? Turns out that she wanted to break up with him and didn't um, take his advances seriously. That certainly leads me away a little bit from him being involved in Jeremy's disappearance. But I would need to know more about Terry and David. What type of people were they? Were they drug addicts? Did they need money? Remember, Jeremy went to that bar to get more money. Could he have been forced to do that? Could he have been partying with this guy? A lot of unanswered questions here. Um, but from what I researched, this Terry is the number one suspect. And if he is, there has got to be more that the public doesn't know about. Right? Because it just doesn't seem... There's just not enough there to go on, is what I'm trying to say. Now, what I want to get to, and to me is the most important aspect of figuring this out, is Johnny. Johnny subsequently started having nightmares. He became an alcoholic, a drug user, he ended up homeless, and he ended up dying in 2011, homeless under a bridge. But by all accounts, Johnny changed dramatically after these murders. Murders. After this disappearance of his friend Jeremy. Now I know through my training and experience when especially individuals who murder, who have never murdered before, experience a murder whether they've done it themselves or they've witnessed the murder they will change 
they will take up habits that maybe they normally didn't have, such as smoking, such as drinking. Or if they did drink, they would drink more. If they did drugs, they would do more drugs. All in an attempt to quiet their inner voices of remorse. What did I do? That's pre prevalent in a lot of cases. Now I need to know more about Johnny. I need to know how he was in school. What was his relationship with Jeremy? Were they from the opposite side of the tracks? Were they best friends since kindergarten? All that stuff is important in figuring out what the heck happened to Jeremy Bright? And why is Johnny so guilt-ridden? I do not want to be one of those people, and I never have been, to say something 100% when I'm not 100%, when I don't really know. But I would say that that is a great place to start. Remember on my rung, I have forcibly removed at the bottom, I have the swimming hole, or the OD and then the swimming hole. And on the very top rung, I would have Johnny Fish, or Johnny Gray, whatever his name is. And I would be so focused in on him before anybody else. Not necessarily as a suspect, um, and probably quite the opposite. But I would be interviewing every one of his friends. I'd want to know more about him almost than Jeremy. I would want to know his victimology, his grades in school, his home life. All the stuff pre-murder or pre-disappearance, right? Because we all know it's a murder. I'm going to say that it's a murder or an accidental death, some sort of cover-up, whatever it was. He wasn't a runaway. All the stuff previous to that, how is he? And then after the disappearance, talk to all those people. If he did hold a job, talk to those people, his parents. To me, Johnny, I believe, is the key to this. Remember, Jeremy went to this fair with Johnny doesn't necessarily mean he's going to leave with Johnny, but he's there with him. They're going to be together. He's the key. I believe he knew. Now, you probably never know now. He, he died, like I said. He died of a drug overdose, I believe. So, but maybe he told somebody. And maybe you can piece it together from possibilities to probabilities by interviewing all of his friends and his family. Unfortunately, that's the way I see it. Not that Johnny was involved, but I think he has knowledge. He thinks he, he witnessed something. And all these... Theories about groups being together, groups of teenagers, and Johnny was in those groups, and something bad happened. I just, I just don't buy that. And the reason I don't buy it is because those people would have came forward and said, I saw this, and have that being corroborated by at least one other person. It doesn't seem to happen here. Again, the swimming hole story... It makes sense to me. What doesn't make sense is he's accidentally shot, they take him to a cabin, and they try to nurse him back to health. That seems a little far-fetched to me. But the swimming aspect, I would want to know by, from mom, what did he pack on this trip? Did he bring swimming trunks with him? He could have borrowed them. Okay, well, who did he borrow them from? Did he take a towel? Was a towel missing from the house? You have to be able to run down those leads, no matter where they take you, in order to say, yes, this is what happened, or no, this isn't what happened. It's very hard, because you'll get a lot of different leads that come in. Some of them are complete and utter garbage. But you got to follow them up. 
And I'm sure the Myrtle Point, Oregon Police Department did that. Um, but he didn't run away, folks. Okay? He didn't run away. What happened to him? You know, I don't know. But I think we can start deducing. Once we learn more about Johnny, I think he was the key to this. And I would love to read, you know, and I didn't even see that he was interviewed by police, but I'm sure he was. I'm sure he had to have been. Had to have been. If he wasn't interviewed, I would be, it would be safe to say it would be the most inept police department investigation this world's ever seen. Okay? He has to be in. I'd love to see those interviews. I'd love to see those transcripts. You could learn so much from it. Where was Johnny during this time? And again, victimology going back to Jeremy. Would he attend a party? You know, is that something out of character for him? What time was he supposed to be home? Just too many holes here. Too many holes. I'd love for the police to send me these reports and let me look over them. I think, uh, I think we could start deducing and get down to a probability of what happened to Jeremy Bright. Okay, well, that's it for today. I'm going to hopefully not keep you guys waiting around longer than what I did, but again, before I get new content out. But again, I'm pretty busy doing some pro bono work, um, working on a serial killer, and uh, it's just, it's very cumbersome, and... A TV show that's going with it so I mean just a, a lot of stuff going on but I'm still trying to get these out for you guys the best I can it didn't help that I moved within the you know the past month and two and I had a lot going on but I got everything set up still will be some tweaks I'm sure but for the most part hey this is what we're getting this is the new backdrop might be some tweaks in it but I think you guys will like it and you'll appreciate it so uh Thanks for tuning in. Until the next episode, Maine's out.